Many of us have some familiarity with the story of Jonah and the whale, or as it's called in Hebrew, the big fish. And actually in Hebrew, it's a female fish, but I digress. Anyway, God tells Jonah, which means in Hebrew, dove, to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. And since we've learned how important geography can be, let's look at this story on a map. So Jonah, um, like a dove, actually flies away. Instead of going to Nineveh, he goes down to Jaffa, gets on a boat, and heads to Tarshish, which is somewhere west on the coast of the Mediterranean. So why doesn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Well, the Jesus Storybook Bible, which is the main Bible I've read my kids when they were small, um, it, it says that it's because the people in Nineveh are Jonah's worst enemies. And that's close, but the question is, why was Nineveh one of Israel's worst enemies? So it's somewhat difficult to read the Old Testament if we don't have a basic understanding of what was going on historically in the ancient Near East during the time Israel became a people. Nineveh, or more broadly, Assyria, was one of Israel's worst enemies. Nineveh was the capital city. But we need to know why that was. Similarly, many of us know the story of David and Goliath, the Philistine. But why would the Philistines have wanted to fight the Israelites in the first place? So to understand this, we're going to take a brief tour of ancient Near Eastern history. We can think of ancient Near Eastern history beginning around 3500 BC and ending in 30, 331 BC. And we can think of it beginning then because the first evidence of cities comes from that time around 3500 BC. And the first writing, which is Sumerian, comes from around 3000 BC. So we're going to hit the highlights of ancient Near Eastern history. Um, but I'll go ahead and say that it really ends when Alexander the Great conquers Persia in 331 because when he takes over, Greek culture really takes over and life changes dramatically. So within these 3,000 years, we can think about history developing in three main stages in terms of political and social developments. So first is the era of city-states, which arise and exist from around 3,000 to 1600 BC. Second comes the era of territorial states from 1600 to the early first millennium. This is a time period where cities are expanding to control more territory, hence territorial states. And finally, the era uh, of empires, the third time period I want you to think of, goes from the early first millennium onward. So briefly, what were each of these three time periods like? Well, the time period of the city-states began with Uruk becoming a city in Mesopotamia. It's really the first city that we know of. The people of Uruk built public buildings, and they built temples. They created artwork. Um, it's during this time that writing systems developed in Egypt and in the states, city-states in Mesopotamia. And though Uruk was the first real city, other cities developed during this time period as well. So Ur, the city where Abraham is from, Lagash, and other places. In this time, populations of cities were growing. Um, each city had a patron deity, meaning that each city had its own god who was thought to reside in that city and protect that city. And there's also a good bit of military conflict at this time. Cities were mainly fighting over resources. They needed water to exist, and so actually a lot of the Sumerian texts that we have found from this time, there are boundary stones and records of battles that were fought over controlling areas of land along Along the rivers. Monumental buildings start to be built that celebrate leaders of different cities and states, and the idea of the divine right of rule develops. And what this means is that the patron deity or god of a city appoints a leader um, or a king to lead and rule that city as that deity's human representative. And the area of territorial states um, then begins around 1600 BC, the second time period we're looking at. And what happens at this point is that city-states have expanded into territories. They're controlling more area, and they want to control more area, so there continues to be military conflict. Now, I want you to look at three different pictures, which show a snapshot of how these territories changed over a period of 300 years. 
So first, let's look at the year 1450 BC. Okay, notice on this map there are nine territories here. Look at how small Assyria is with Mitanni surrounding it. And then Babylon is controlling most of the lower part of Mesopotamia. Notice Hatti up there in the northwest area. And then notice what part of the land Egypt is controlling. That area along the coast of the Mediterranean, uh, Syria, Palestine, is what will later become the land of Israel. All right, now let's time lapse to 1350 BC. And what do you notice? Well, for starters, what you should notice is that there's only eight territories now. Hatti is bigger. Hatti has swallowed up Kizawatna, and that explains why you've never heard of Kizawatna until this moment. Assyria has expanded a little, and keep your eye on the Mediterranean coast, okay, or the Levant, where Israel later appears. It looks like Hatti has pushed Egypt back. Hatti is now controlling some of that land. Okay, final picture here from about 100 years after that in 1220 BC. We're now down to six territories, and Hatti has pushed Egypt all the way back down the coast. Um, Assyria, Babylon, and Egypt have grown, uh, which is leading us to the final stage of ancient Near Eastern history, the time period of empires, where these three empires are the major players who dominate the historical landscape. Um, now, in addition to just seeing how the territories grew and conquered each other, what I want to make sure you see here is that these territories wanted the land of Canaan, later Israel. These years are characterized by fighting over this um, territory or area along the Mediterranean coast. The Hittites and the Egyptians wanted to control trade routes and travel routes, and to do that, they had to control the area of Canaan. Now, during this time period of territorial states, there are some individuals who sometimes get discussed in conjunction with the biblical narrative. So first, in Mesopotamia, there's King Hammurabi of Babylon. He was ruler of Babylon during this time. And at the top of this monument you see here, there's an engraving of him being handed the divine right to rule by Marduk, the, the patron god of Babylon. And... All the rest of the monument is a law code, one of the oldest law codes that we have. And it's really interesting to some Old Testament scholars because it has a lot of similar laws to what we find in the Old Testament. So, for example, the eye for an eye concept is found in Hammurabi's law code. And it reads, if a man put out the eye of another man, his eye shall be put out. Um, and then it goes on. And this reminds some people of Exodus 21, 23 through 24, which reads, but if there is serious injury, you are, should, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, and so forth. Some of the kings of Egypt or pharaohs during this time period were Tutmos in the 15th century. Uh, next, there was Akhenaten, who infamously tried to institute worship of only one deity in Egypt, which did not really work out for him. Um, there, is, there was King Tut, who was the boy pharaoh who died at age 19, and his tomb with everything intact was found in 1922. And then there's Ramses II in the 13th century, who may have been the pharaoh during Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Right, Israel, where are they? Um, well, the earliest piece of evidence that we have outside of the Bible for the existence of the people of Israel um, and information about their whereabouts is called the Merneptah Stela. And it's a victory monument of Pharaoh Merneptah. Now, in the monument, Pharaoh Merneptah is boasting about conquering the land of Canaan, and he brags that Israel has been destroyed. And this stela dates to around 1207 B.C. So what might this mean for the historical timeline of Israel? Well, we don't actually know exactly when the exodus out of um, Egypt for Israel was, but one guess is that the exodus out of Egypt occurred during the reign of Ramses II around 1265 BC. And then perhaps Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, and then Israel entering and settling into the land of Canaan. And then around 1207 BC, Pharaoh Merneptah goes on military campaign to Canaan and brags that he has conquered everyone there, saying, Israel is laid waste, his seed is not. All lands together, they are pacified. 
Okay, so one thing you might be thinking is, wouldn't that be a lie then? Because Israel wasn't destroyed at that time, right? So the thing about victory monuments in the ancient Near East is that regardless of the particulars of the battle, they celebrate victory. Um, descriptions of military battles from this time often use hyperbolic language to describe a victory. So they're going to say, we killed everyone and everything. And what they mean is, we won this battle. The language can be so hyperbolic at times that it can be hard for historians to reconstruct what actually happened. So, for example, the Battle of Kadesh is one of the most well-documented battles from this time period. It was between Hatti and Egypt during Ramses II, um, his reign, and both sides claim to have won this battle. So we don't really know who won this battle. Um, now, at the end of the period of the territorial states, which coincides with the late Bronze Age, um, something, ha something major happens between this time period and the final time period of the ancient Near East, the Age of Empires. The territories don't just have a smooth transition to where Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon just gobble up the other territories and become empires. Um, in fact, the opposite happens. There's a huge and utterly massive collapse of the international system. The year 1177 marks a major breakdown where things are wrecked, and we kind of know what happened, but there's still a lot that's a mystery about it. We know that some groups of people, often called the Sea Peoples, invaded Egypt and Canaan and Hatti from the west by way of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, we have letters from kings. Um, there's one from a king of one area to a king of another area, uh, king of Ugarit to the king of Cyprus that reads, My father, now the ships of the enemy have come. They have been setting fire to my cities and have done harm to the land. So we have lots of correspondence like this where we know that there were these sea people enemies um, causing destruction. And while they caused a lot of destruction, they left no monuments celebrating or describing their invasion. And many of them, except for one group known as the Philistines, seem to have disappeared. So there's evidence of environmental destruction in different areas at this time that goes beyond what the sea peoples could have done. One scholar calls this time period a perfect storm of calamities. There's Seem to have been a combination of earthquakes, famine, and other unknown crises. And the collapse of the centralized structures caused Egypt and Hatti and Assyria to retreat far back inland and resulting in something that was significant for the establishment and the survival of Israel as a people. Uh, with Hatti, Egypt, and Assyria having been decentralized by military invasion and environmental crises, Israel would not face pressure from these giants for a couple hundred years. One group of the Sea Peoples who did stay and settle in this area were called the Peleset, or the Philistines, to us. As we'll read, during the time of Saul and David, the Philistines and Israel were regularly fighting over territory. The Philistines controlled the best part of the coast. For the big territories, like Egypt and Assyria, they entered a dark age, meaning we don't have much record of what was going on at this time from about 1100 to 900 BC. They were likely at home trying to rebuild, and this is a time when Israel is really established as a people.